and here we are on Amulet. And I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle and ask you to just for a minute take inventory of yourself. What jewelry are you wearing right now? What's on it? Why did you pick that jewelry today? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to people looking at you? And how how does it relate to the kind of categories we've been talking about? Like, to what degree is it a ritual item for you? Do you touch it? Do you think about someone or something specific when you look at it or feel it on you? Um, did you choose it because it's a way of visibly showing people what your religious beliefs are, who you love, who you value? Did you buy it from a specific place because of who made it, where it came from, what its history was, uh, who got the money from it? Um, things like that. And I'll, I'll start. I've got two pieces of jewelry on right now. Actually, no, no, four, four. I've got my glasses. So I wear these because I have astigmatism and it also blocks blue light. So I wear them for medico ritual reasons. Um, also, I think they, they look rather nice. They're, they're blue and they're nifty Japanese company makes them, so I like them very much. Blue tortoise shell. They're cool, kind of look vintagey, like them. And that's a legit reason. It's pretty. I like it. We call that aesthetic attraction or aesthetic reasons, and they are just as important as the other things. All right, so this finger has my engagement ring, which um, Mr. Spouse got for me back before he was Mr. Spouse, of course. Fingers have swollen. Here we go. But it's made out of amber, and it's got little inclusions in it, including a tiny fly, which I love. So it's fossilized. If I rub it on flannel, I can make it spark, which is another cool thing amber does. More about that later. So it's amber, and it's sterling nickel-free silver, because I'm allergic to nickel. And I not really a diamond person and I didn't want something expensive or big that would catch on stuff so some of this is for practicality um, silver because I like that metal better it's also what we could afford at the point and uh, let's see oh also he says it looks like my eyes which is so sweet I just yeah so I wear this for um, I like Mr. Spouse reasons and then this is my wedding band. We've seen this earlier. So it has Trinity knots um, as a nod to our religion. And it's made out of silver and gold, so it'll go with a lot of things. But also like marriage, you know, it's people getting together and promising that they'll not hate each other in 50 years and trying very hard not to. And so far succeeding. Oh. And then he's got one too. Here we go. Show me the match set. Here we are. All right. So here's here's Mr. Spouse's giant version of my ring. Do the trick. You can squeeze mine into the middle of his, which is kind of cool. But that's mostly because he's huge. When I met him, though, we were in middle school, and he was not huge at that point. I was taller. It was a while ago. Mm. Uh, is my ring stuck? No, it's not. There we go. Right. So there are ritual reasons why I have this ring, right? It's got a design that's a reference to religious beliefs. It's something that I first put on in the middle of a religious ceremony, but it's also about commitment and mortal love. And it's also something that I can flash apotropaically at creepy folks in bars which has been useful on more than one occasion and it's sad that i have to use apotropaic wedding rings to have my way but that's it and then here is my watch my watch has no religious significance to me and in a perfect world i would not need it but i have a really hard time with time blindness and i need the time physically attached to my wrist or i will not notice when it is so this is 
a practical functional piece, but if I wanted practical functional, I could have gotten like a $20 watch off of Amazon. Uh, this one is more than that. It's uh, self-winding and mechanical, I like mechanical old things. Just, I like old things. I'm a historian. What do you want? Um, and it also looks old timey and it's just, it's nifty, but I'm too lazy to ever set the calendar day on it right. Like it thinks, thinks it's the seventh of, of what now? Who knows? It's just the seventh of something. On somebody's calendar, it's the seventh. So this is a thing that we should start with us doing because it's very easy to fall into a habit of looking at ancient people's jewelry and immediately sliding to the, oh, that's superstitious and it's magic and that's weird and that's different. No, no, we have our own rituals and habits that we do with our jewelry. We tap our rings onto things for luck. We look at them to remember the people we love. We twist them when we're nervous as a kind of you know, grounding stim sort of thing so we can not be so freaked out by things. Celebrities design them for us and we'll pay a lot of money for them, which is why I've not been on Jane Seymour, but oh, drat, the slides fit switched. At any rate, on to the purpose for ancient people. Some of these are going to be familiar. Some of them you may not have seen, just depending on the people you know. So a big one is protection. And that makes a lot of sense, all right? Within my inventory of my stuff, some of the stuff I wear is a little protective. I mean, even the glasses kind of keep my eyeballs from getting banged up. My watch keeps me showing up in a timely fashion so I don't lose my job. That's kind of atropaic to getting rid of the spirits of joblessness, I guess. Um, got my apotropaic don't hit on me, please ring. You know, so there are, even though like, I'm socially distanced, like I don't need this for apotropaic, but if I need it, I've got it. Sometimes it's not the point. <laughs> so in the ancient world, the kind of things that you were trying to protect yourself from that you'd wear things for were pretty predictable. So things like disease, evil spirits, there's some slippage in that category there. You don't want to get possessed because this is a culture where possession is considered a thing that can happen by most folks. Um, need to correct the spelling, but also pregnancy. Uh, for various reasons, you may not want to be pregnant all of the time. It can be really dangerous. So you might not want to do that all the time, or you might want to choose to do it or not. And in a world before there was reliable and useful contraception, uh, for instance, one of the ways that contraceptive medicine worked in the ancient world was by um, putting crocodile dung in as a vaginal suppository. No, thank you. Also, I'm not sure that would work, so please don't try it. You also get jewelry that was tied to victory and success, at least texts that talk about them as victory things. Now, that may seem a little weird, but we have good luck charms. Sometimes we wear things because something great happened to us and we want to keep that feeling, so we keep the thing on. Um, I had this silver dollar in my shoe when I got married because of this verse about what you should have on your person when you get married. And you know, luck helps with that kind of commitment. It makes sense. So the kinds of things are pretty much the stuff that we still sometimes want with our jewelry. So economic success, success both to attract it to us and to advertise that we have gotten it. So you can wear the fancy ring and it says, yes, I'm rich, but also there's a bit of a certain stones can attract extra wealth to you logic that pops up in ancient gemstone lore, so that's a thing. Also, erotic victory, so if you want to be lovable or otherwise attractive to the opposite sex, then you might get jewelry that's meant to pull that towards you. Um, lots of stuff with arrows on them. Also, you might gift this to somebody that you want to like you, and this is some place where we have a lot in common with the ancient Mediterranean, right? If you want somebody to love you, a gift that you sometimes get them, or maybe they already love you and you want to give them a 
thing that shows that love would be jewelry. I've watched enough 90 Day Fiance to be able to attest to the um, uneven success of such an approach, but I'm not going to judge. I mean, look, I'm, I'm wearing this, so sometimes it works. Uh, agonistic is one that needs a little bit more explanation. So this is when you're in some kind of a contest. And this includes stuff like lawyer jewelry. So lawyer jewelry was a thing where you'd wear certain gemstones or items on your person to be a better lawyer. So keep that in mind as you're preparing your cases. But also if you're a competitive person in the sports world, so gladiators would wear stuff to be better gladiators if they could afford it, which was unusual because most of them were enslaved. And But also if you're a competitive athlete in the Olympics, perhaps, you might wear something that was meant to give you extra winning vibes. Judicial is part of this world, so it's not just lawyers. If you're being sued, you might get some anti-lawsuit jewelry that was meant to protect you from incoming lawsuit. A lot of this looks very much like negative magic. Again, negative magic doesn't mean it's bad. Negative magic means you're pushing stuff away from you, but some of it's also positive magic. So you're trying to attract the good things to your person and you wear jewelry on your body. So it helps like, you know, the magic might be confused if it's going to a statue in your house, but if it's like right there on your hand, you're easier to find. Pro tip. Now, here is where it gets a little bit more into what we more familiar, familiarly classify as magic. That is new powers. So rings of invisibility are a thing in the ancient world that some people thought actually existed. Some people sold them and the sketchiness ensued. Hades, the god of the underworld, allegedly had this helmet that would make him invisible because death is invisible. So yeah, uh, Bilbo Baggins owes a lot to the ancient Mediterranean, is what I'm saying here. But much like Rings of Power, these often come with a bit of a price. Um, you may not be hunted down to your doom by an animate eyeball whose body was confiscated for prior bad acts in the Second Age, mind you. But you could, much like Gollum, waste away to a shadow of yourself and end up living in the mountains eating fish. I'm not sure if that's something I can find a direct parallel in the ancient world for. Interestingly, though, Tolkien did get the idea for the One Ring out of a Roman era archaeological find where some dude had his ring stolen by this other dude and it had his name on it. And he deposited a defixio, which is basically like a, a theft police report, only you file it with the underworld. We'll be talking about them in cycle six. It's basically like cursing the dude who stole his ring, and then we also found the ring. So there are legit cursed rings from the Roman world, and at least one of them we have found, which is... Uh, Great. I have no information on how the British Museum has fared since its acquisition of the ring. I think it's in the British Museum now. Maybe they should be more worried. But quite frankly, in the British Museum's collection, they're likely to have bad karma from a lot of other things before it comes to the one ring. So finally, Healing and protection from disease is another big category for this kind of stuff. That's a little bit up with the first category, but I put it in another bullet point because this list exists to start you thinking on ideas for your own objects. So what kind of effect do you want your item to have? Here is a list of possibilities. If you manage to make something that makes you invisible, I really want to know how that worked out for you. I'm not saying I have aspirations to be a second elf, second age elf of Regeon, but she is. true. Call me Celebramor. Okay, right. So stuff you can make this out of, although not you personally, because I don't expect you to have a large amount of gold stored in your apartment. But 
these are things that you can make. So a lamella, we've looked at these before. These are those sheets of metal. You can make yours out of tin foil. I don't know what the magical property of aluminum is, but perhaps you can tell me. Kind of think about your associations with aluminum and come up with something. Google the internet. I'm sure the internet has opinions. You can also make these out of paper too, so it's got slips of papyri down later. Papyrus is nice because it's consumable, so you can burn it as a way of activating the charm, or you can wear it on you, so it gives you some more options. Consumability is part of the logic with these wearables. But in the ancient world, we find these made out of gold, silver, bronze, lead, tin, with writing on them, although the writing doesn't necessarily read as anything, so some of them we think may have been made by illiterate people with like nonsense letters. But we're not 100% sure it's illiterate people. It might also be because you're trying to make magic writing. One of the ways to make magic writing is just put a bunch of letters together. And sometimes there is um, isobsphethia. Gosh, someday I will say that word correctly. Involved too. More later. We also find specific stones in use for different effects. If you want a full list of what you use for what, you can look at Pliny the Elder's book uh, 36, I think, or is it 37? Um, he's got one book for metals and one book for gemstones. I'll put up the link if you're interested to a translation where you can just kind of like control find and then look. Things that we find most often in this kind of application. Jasper, hematite, by far hematite is the one we see the most frequently. We'll get into reasons in a minute. Agates, so pretty looking but easy enough to find stones. Onyx, because it's like this deep black color. And lapis lazuli, because it's from Egypt. And it's bright blue, it's very pretty. Prettiness and aesthetics are a big part of the logic here. We also find wearables with organic things in them, so a lot of beans, because if you think about a bean, it's like a little plant embryo. Like first it's a bean, and then it's a plant. How? I mean, we kind of know how, but we still don't. Life is still an incredibly mysterious and... Um, numinous process. The word numinous means something that has the awe of the divine in it. And beans for me do that. Maybe not for you, but I find beans thrilling. Also like liquid water on a planet's surface. Sometimes there's liquid water on Pluto. It makes me so happy. Okay, right. So back to magical gemstones and beans and things. Uh, we also see bits and pieces of animals, hyena parts, apparently were really good for this. So if you have hyena bits around your house, you are in luck, bucko. But also snake bits, um, any animal that's thought to have magical properties in its body or to be unusual or to be dangerous, hence the snakes, scorpions. Uh, but also sometimes question mark like live flies were a part of anti-malarial wearables you'd take a slip of paper papyrus you'd write abracadabra on it wrap it up with a live fly put it in a little bag and wear it around your neck no malaria allegedly so let's see these could be put inside a space in a ring or they could be tucked under a ring or put in some kind of a container around your neck. Uh, you sometimes would carry it in your clothing or slip it in your hair or stick it down your bra. There are all kinds of places on your body that these show up. And not just your living body either. They end up in burials tucked in shrouds or cremated remains. Or in Egypt, you're literally wrapping them into the bandages surrounding your mummified corpse. So there are all kinds of options for what you might want to do with this thing that you're making and where you want to wear it or uh, where you want your hypothetical character to wear it if you yourself don't feel comfortable making you yourself a thing. Just perfectly fine. Totally support that. Okay, so let's look at the Roman jewelry we've been talking about here. Here are a few options 
options for what Roman jewelry would have looked like. And this is just a smattering of really representative examples. So the Romans loved gold when they could get it, but silver, if not bronze, sometimes too, although that's going to turn your skin green, but bronze, we find lots and lots of bronze rings from antiquity. And that's an affordable but still nice metal. It's going to be durable. It's not going to rust. Although iron jewelry is also a thing. Roman citizens would frequently wear an iron ring as proof of their citizenship. So, yeah, any kind of metal that you can make into jewelry probably is used for jewelry in the ancient world. But these are some really nice ones. I'm particularly fond, turn on my pen here, of this bracelet, which was wrapped around a young woman's upper arm. She was found in Herculaneum, poor lady. Dead, obviously. I mean, she, ancient Roman person, she's dead, but a horrible volcano death. Sad. Where stones are put into ancient jewelry, they aren't cut and faceted like modern stones. It's actually a very recent development that we cut stones to make them faceted. And this has to do with the mechanics of ancient lights. It wasn't that they couldn't cut stones. And you see right here is a stone that somebody has cut with a human face into it. It's a portrait stone that you would smush into wax and use to sign papers. Which is another thing you do with jewelry is you use it as your calling card and your password protection. This has to do with aesthetics without electric lighting. So one thing electric lighting does is it makes gemstones sparkle a lot and it can bring out uh, more color than you can with yellow toned lamplight. In yellow toned lamplight, you want a smooth surface on the stone. Like I've got, uh, this is called a cabochon. It's not even a cut, it's, it's a way of preparing the jewel where it's just been smoothed down it's kind of in a diamond shape, but it doesn't have any sharp surfaces on it, so there aren't any facets to make it sparkle. And this makes it so you can see into the amber really clearly and you can see everything that's in it, which is what you want to do with a natural gemstone in the ancient world. If you polish it and make it smooth and not too deep, you can see the color properly. If you don't put a backing on it, you can see through it, which is fun if you're entertaining yourself with your gemstones. So this is one of the interactions you might have with your jewelry. It's kind of holding it up and being like, oh, look, everything's green because it's an emerald. I'm so rich. Apparently the Emperor Nero liked doing this. So tacky, Nero. You also get things like this one where somebody's taken a coin and put it in their ring, which is a very direct way of saying, I'm rich. Look, I have money in my ring. Cool. Here's a specific kind of ring that you see a lot coming out of the ancient Mediterranean. This is a ring showing two hands clasping. And this is the kind of ring that you get as a gift for somebody you were either a business partner with or marrying, or very, very close friends or lovers, any kind of really intimate relationship that you want to commemorate with a ring, you do with this kind of ring. One of the most frequent things that we find is the word monoia, which means oneness, togetherness, being of one mind. It's from the same root that gives us mono, like mononucleosis or um, monocycle, monocle, other things that start with mono. This, by the way, is a seashell that's been cut back. It's a cameo. So the outer layer of the seashell is white, and then the backing of the seashell is dark, and that lets it stand out really nicely. This one is just imprinted into the gold of the ring, but when you go to seal things with it, then it's going to make this hand-clasped Manoia thing. So this is from the joining of hands when you get married or you seal a deal. It's the same reason we do handshakes. So this still looks the same after 2,000 years. And this was what you'd normally give to someone that you were engaged to, married to, in a long-term committed partnership of some kind with, economic, personal, or both. And this is meant to symbolize equality, fidelity. One of my favorite non-Monoya inscriptions on this is uh, Te Parum Amo, which is, um, I don't love you enough, which isn't like, you know, oh, I'm guilty and I don't love you enough. That's it's not that passive aggressive. It's like, I wish I could love you as much as you deserve to be loved, but I just, I, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to keep trying. Just so damn sweet. 
At any rate, this is one of the many things you may have on your ancient jewelry. And we can look at this either as just a cultural tick or habit, or we can look at this as a religious ritual item, right? It's an item that symbolizes an intangible relationship. It's one that creates a permanent memorial to a commitment that you've made that's constantly on your hand reminding you. But it's also got a bit of an apotropaic function. People see that and they're like, oh, oh, you're committed. So it's a way of both flexing your committedness, but also keeping people away from the person you gave the ring to, if we want to get like creepy and controlling about this, but that's part of what's going on here. And it's also a way that perhaps if you're not entirely sure that your affection is being returned, you can kind of like try to reel them back in with this. Oh gosh, this went to a dark, depressing place, didn't it? But all of these things can underlie this ring. And all of these meanings can exist at once or absent each other. So they can be polyvalent, right? Many of the meanings can exist together. Or one person can wear it for completely different reasons than another person's wearing it. And it's both visible and invisible. You look at this on someone and you make assumptions about them. They're communicating something to you, but only they know what that ring really means to them. So there's an element of display and privacy that's both preserved and promulgated by the wearing of jewelry. One of the interesting things about jewelry is you can choose where to wear it, how to conceal it, what finger to put it on. All of these things add meaning to the act of wearing. And that's something that is important to the kind of logic we see being used when jewelry comes in contact with magical practices. Things that you can put on your amulets and jewelry. Here's one called a Hecation. This is an image of the goddess Hecate. We've talked about her earlier. They're really easy to spot. Three bodies, it's Hecate. There she is. Interesting thing about these particular Hecatia though, is they're wearing this like column base hat thing. This is associated with Isis and Serapis, these somewhat Greek, Greekified, um, Hellenized is the classier word for that versions of Isis and Osiris. So there's a little bit of Egyptianness in here too. This particular one is a stone from a ring. It's fallen out. And it, if you look at the, the surface, it's kind of this irony gunmetal color. That's because it's hematite. Hematite is a gemstone that's got a high iron content, and in the presence of moisture, it can actually rust a little bit, especially at the cut edges, and that is why it's sometimes also called a bloodstone, because it can look like blood, which is partly why this is one of the most common, commonly used gemstones in jewelry that we think is associated more heavily with uh, magic coated beliefs. But because it's got iron in it, it can be magnetized, which is the other thing about hematite that seems a little bit supernatural is that it's, ooh, it's a stone that actually does attract stuff to it. So if you're trying to attract luck to you, what better thing to use than a luck magnet, a literal luck magnet. A couple other pieces of commonly used material. Here is a barrel. This is really fancy. It's a kind of emeraldy gemstone. And this has arrows with a Jungs wheel. Probably somebody wants to attract the um, essence of sexy beastliness to themselves. You go you. On the other side is this amber piece, which I find a little bit more interesting. Amber was frequently used in stuff for teething children. In fact, you can still buy amber for teething children. But adults wore it too. It was thought to be protective and warming. One of the things that amber does is it can hold a static charge a little bit. So if I were to let's see if I can make it, and probably the silver won't let it. Okay, no, it's not shocking me right now. It's, this isn't working, but sometimes you can do this with Amber. This particular one is in the shape of a gladiator's helmet. 
I cannot comment. Well, I could comment on why, but we're not sure why entirely. But the fact that it's pierced at the top means that this would have been on a string. Very likely, this would have been on a string for a baby necklace. So babies would wear necklaces with a bunch of these charms on it, loosely tied around their neck, and then they kind of gnaw on it and use it as toys and things. And other than a choking hazard. These often had protective symbols on them, so part of why this is a gladiator's helmet, yeah, I am going to speculate, might be that if you're in a society with high childhood mortality and you really want your baby to not die, then putting the visage of a heavily armed gladiator on amber on a string around your baby's neck makes sense as an apotropaic measure to scare away bad luck, like your baby now has a gladiator protecting their face, literally to them. So that makes sense to me, which also makes this just so sad in a way too, is that, yeah, I hope this baby was okay. This I think was found in Pompeii and I don't, yeah, I can't remember if child skeletons were involved, but we do find child skeletons with this kind of thing around it pretty frequently. Next up, we're getting into um, post-colonialist land again a little bit, or at least intercultural exchange. Ice, as I've mentioned, is very popular for this kind of stuff. Ice is was a breakaway hit goddess in the Greek and Roman world of the first two centuries CE, really BCE too. She was seen as a savior goddess distinct from the goddesses of the Greek and Roman pantheon. There isn't really an equivalent for Isis as such, like some people thought maybe Demeter, but no, not really. Isis, because her mythological face that she wears in Egyptian religion is that she finds her dead husband chopped up into pieces, puts him back together, invents mummification, reanimates his corpse and makes him again into the living king of the dead and then has a baby with him afterwards. So she's a savior goddess in impossible circumstances who comes and bails you out when you're in the most extreme of extreme circumstances. So she was a goddess that had the Egyptian powerfulness going for her. She's associated with snakes in Egyptian iconography, so that reads well for people with Greek and Roman polytheist visual languages. And she's a goddess that's likely to be sympathetic to you if you're trying your best in a world that's hostile and difficult to deal with. So Isis frequently was one of these people that you would put in your household shrine and on your jewelry and appeal to if you were in a scary situa situation and you needed help. Now, here we're going to start veering into territory of gods that you definitely did not hear about in Greco-Roman mythology classes because they're not in there. In fact, these are gods that only show up in these kinds of objects, these ritual, private worship, and jewelry objects. The first of them is this daimon, this um, minor deity spirit person called Chinubis or Chonubis. Sometimes it's C-H-O-N-O-U-B-I-S, or there are a bunch of ways of spelling this. You can tell you're looking at Chinubis because there's a lion head with a mane, like an African maned lion, silhouetted against a probably rising sun, maybe associated either with the sun disk of Egyptian religion or with the unconquered sun, the soul in Wictus, who was a god worshipped on the winter solstice. The body is that of a snake coiled around and kind of snaky bottom. So it's half snake, half lion on a sun with this kind of Egyptian-y sounding name that isn't actually Egyptian. It kind of sounds like you're saying Anubis, but you sneeze. That was maybe insensitive, but there we are. We're not sure why the name comes up. People pray to this name, but we, is there a backstory? Why half lion, half snake? Why the sun? What, what? 
we are not entirely sure. That information seems to have been lost. Nobody thought that that needed explanation in the ancient world that I'm aware of, unless we found something and nobody sent me a memo. So here's Chonubis again. And to give you an idea of why we know that this is his name, he's labeled. So here's the C-H, N, O U. So Chonu, and then it says Mayo for some reason. So this is Chonubus, not Chonubus. Spelling is not standardized in the ancient world. That's in Greek, by the way. A couple other things going on in here that you're going to see on uh, wearable jewelry that's more explicitly trying to have powers beyond wearability. This symbol here, where we've got three S's and a line through it, that shows up a lot. We have no idea why. We don't know what that means. It may have something to do with snakes. And three is a number with a lot of significance in ancient religion, uh, particularly ancient religion coming out of the Near East and Judaism, which was also a major and growing religion during the first centuries BCE and CE. Um, it was one of the great expansion periods for Jewish converts. Um, a lot of them end up morphing into the early Christian church. It's, it's complicated. Suffice to say that there might be some of that, but we're not entirely sure. Down at the bottom, there are these two little star symbols. We see that a lot. We're not sure why, but they show up a lot. They're often mirrored to each other on the art. One thing that we notice in a lot of this kind of um, jewelry carving that you don't leave a lot of negative space. So negative space is the space around the figures on a piece of art. When you're trying to make an amulet sort of object, you want to use all of the space you can to stuff in all of the supernatural protectiveness that you can. And you can see that on full display here. So a very nice looking Chonubis. We've got this awkward space we filled with this character. We filled in either side with a little squiggly tail. And then at the very bottom, we have a Braxas. So that's Alpha, Beta, Rho, Upper, Alpha, Sigma, Alpha, Sigma. Trust me that those are both Sigmas. Just go with it here. More about a Braxas in a minute. Now, this is a two sided gemstone. We see this a lot on pendants, but also on rings, where it'll have one figure on the outside and another figure on the inside. Often we don't know which side's which because these stones tend to fall out of the rings. So we'll just find this stone, but not find the ring, or we'll find them separated and we don't know which was outward facing. So it's possible that Chonubis was on the inside that goes next to your skin, and then on the outside for everybody else to see. And if I were guessing that this is where my bet would lie, but it's not a very firm guess. On the outside, probably, at least on the other side, and this is hematite, by the way, this, if it's a dark stone that's been carved into, chances are it's hematite. So we have Asclepius, the god of healing, although it might also be Podolirius and Rakion. Asclepius usually has a beard, but it's hard to do beards on these tiny stones and these are tiny like these are like ring size stones so you have to have a good eye this is blown up several times you can tell you're looking at Asclepius because he has a stick with one snake not two snakes two snakes is Hermes taking you to the underworld one snake god of healing and if you see a female figure with a she's usually holding a snake and it's coming up and drinking out of a bowl that she's holding. That's Hygieia, the goddess of preventative medicine, of health. We get hygiene from her name. So we have health gods on the one side, we have Chinubis on the other side. We think what's going on here is a please don't let me get sick and die ring. Next up, we have some very creative syncretism where we might have a combination of Mithras. So Mithras was a faux Persian deity who was very beloved by Roman soldiers throughout the empire. It was a men's only uh, religious cult. They'd worship in caves underneath the ground. The zodiac seems to have been important. We don't have a ton of details about other things because it was one of these mystery religions. Or it's a mystery, we don't know. But 
here, possibly Mithras, uh, a male figure surrounded by the zodiac is often Mithras, but then there's a snake on top of his head, which is a fire crown, which is also Sol Invictus, but then there's this one snake thing, and he's kind of got a lion mane hairdo, so we think this might be a combination of aspects of Mithras and Chonubis. But this is something that you can do as you're thinking about what you want to put on your clay jewelry or whatever it is you're making your jewelry out of. More is more and you can mix and match. So whatever mixing and matching means for you, whether it's like um, putting aspects of Cookie Monster together with Count Dracula, or if you want to go more old school and use your polytheistic pantheon. So here's a Brack sauce. I mentioned that we were gonna find out more. Here's where we find out more. So this is that name that was scrolled on the bottom of the one Chonubis we were looking at a minute ago with the stars and the extra symbols. Abraxos is another daimon like Chonubis and he's he's really something. It's a male figure wearing full elite armor. So this is a full molded breastplate armor or sometimes um, a thorax, so a Greek style breastplate, with two snake legs instead of one. That's how you know it's not Chonubis. Also a rooster head. And in on one arm he's got a Greek round shield, so a hoplon on his left arm, and then in his right arm a flail or a whip. We know that the letters of his name add up to make 365, which is the number of days in an ancient year and a modern year as well. So that's a thing, but we're not entirely sure what's going on with this either, other than he seems to be a protector deity and the imagery is consistent with that. You've got the chthonic feet with the snaky things. Uh, roosters are protective-ish. They're very, if you've met a rooster, they're aggressive. They're protective. Um, they can be especially aggressive to people they don't know, or just people. They're dinosaurs. Theropods are a little bit vicious. And the armor is also suggestive of protection, right? He's dressed for battle. He's got a shield. The Well, one of the odd things here is that he's not got it. Normally, if you're fighting with this kind of shield, you'd have a spear in your hand. The flail is unusual. Um, is a uh, one of the more honest things we can say here. So, uh, other things going on on these images that you may want to think about for when you're making yours. Greek letters often appear on the surface of the shield or around the figure, and you can also see they're varying levels of artistic expertise here. So this mother of pearl piece is clearly been done by a professional, like A plus very good art. This hematite, it's it's okay. And then we've got this budget piece. I think this is also hematite. It might also be marble stone though. Um, this is not a high budget of rock sauce. And there might even be some compensation in that extra negative space has been filled. Maybe it's a, sorry, the art isn't good, but here's some extra power marks on it. But really, the quality of the art isn't the point, which is one of the many reasons. I'm not grading on quality of art. Like, don't feel self-conscious if you're not good at clay. I'm not either. It doesn't matter for ancient art, and it shouldn't matter for us either. It's the making of the thing. It's not the, although the final product helps you on Etsy. Here we have Yoda, Alpha, and Omega, and then here just Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. This is also associated with um, divinity, particularly coming out of Judaism and early Christianity. Uh, this is linked to something in Christianity. Jesus at one point says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end that's a way of a shorthand of saying, you know, this is the beginning God and the end God. And that's the kind of authority you want to invoke when you're getting somebody to protect your neck from evil. Similarly, we've got these star things again. Again, we don't know. 
And then there's this extra curve down here, which is either the moon or it might be a boat. More about that in a minute. So here are some more ideas, this time from another hematite. This is from a ring bezel, and here we can tell which side would have gone up and down. So this is the outside here. Uh, let me get the star. And then this is the inside. I'll use smiley face for the inside. Oh, it's a horrible smiley face. It's hard to see here, but there have been letters put around the edge of the human figure on a horse spearing another human figure, and it says Solomon, which I have uh, put up here for you. So, no. And uh, we're not sure who Solomon is spearing. Uh, the hair looks long, though, but it, it's un it's kind of hard to no. tell who, who that figure is and, and why, but for some reason, Solomon is on a horse and spearing somebody. The negative space here is filled with another one of these star thingies. This might also be star thingies, or it might just be damage. You can see here where the hematites developed a little bit of rust on the edges. Uh, this ring seems to have gotten some heavy use. And then in the inside, there's another inscription. So this says, Sfra at the top, gist aeon. So fragis theon, which is a Greek compound word that means the divine seal. Sfragis is the, the seal. Theos, like theology, that's divine. Either that or the the god is the seal, or God is the seal, if we're just Theos gets used in Greek to talk about the god of both Judaism and Christianity. So this might, well, not even might, this is probably either a Jewish or a Christian person's answer to this sort of um, wearable object. Down here at the bottom is that thing with the three S's and the line through it. Again, like we're not entirely sure, but lest you think that ancient Greece and Rome is the entire, the only place where people are putting little scribbles that they're not entirely sure what they mean, um, let me submit to you this classic from middle school. Let's see if I can do it. You know, this, this S thing that people scribbled in their notebooks and got in trouble, at least I did because it was the 80s and satanic panic was a thing. But that S thing, there are a lot of speculative people on the internet who have tried to figure out what the heck this thing is. Why do we draw it? What's going on with this? Uh, other than it looks cool and kind of badass, we are at a loss. This, for us, is a character, and the ancient equivalent might be this SSS thing with a line through it. It's, well, we're not entirely sure. It's a thing. One thing that's worth pointing out, though, is that the sestertius, the symbol for sestertius in Latin, is an S with an H drawn through it, like that. That should be familiar to you. So, on to the slightly awkward portion. Another option that you may want to consider when making your amulet is the Foscinum. And this is one place where Greek and Roman culture differs significantly from modern American culture, where it is not socially acceptable to wear a phallic object around your neck in most, I mean, some people do. However, this is not something that we're used to seeing. For an ancient Roman, though, this is exactly the kind of thing that you'd want on your baby's necklace. You might get one for your grandma if you can't think of a gift to get her for Saturnalia. We find them in all different budget ranges. So this is a more affordable range. And oh, this is going to be slightly off color, but a student two years ago said this, and I found it very apt. 
that this is erection protection from every direction. Allow me to explain. So the idea behind the phallus as um, a piece of jewelry that you'd wear in ancient Rome was that this was one way to get the evil eye to move away from you. So it's apotropaic negative magic. And the thought was that if the evil eye is being turned towards you and it sees an erect phallus, it's going to freak out and run because apparently the evil eye does not want unsolicited dick pics. Honestly, same evil eye, same. So some of the logic behind this was that the erect phallus was a not so veiled rape threat that it was meant to shock and intimidate and cause evil eyes to run away and there's some gender coding in there too uh, often you'll hear it called offhand a fertility symbol this misses the point while it is associated with protecting gardens and keeping pests from eating your produce it's not meant to make your produce have more produce it's not meant to make your wife get pregnant more or you get pregnant more, or somebody get pregnant more. It's not that kind of fertility. And that has to do with uh, modern knee-jerk European assumptions where if you see a phallus, ah, fertility, must be fertility. And for, by fertility, we mean penises make you pregnant. And that's not always the visual reference that a culture is going for. And this is one of those cases. So this is meant to be aggressive and off-putting to evil and people of ill intent, specifically people who envy you. There was a thought that if somebody envies you, uh, their look at you can be threatening on a supernatural level. But if you think about it for a minute, that's not wrong. Envy, the word envy, by the way, comes from the Latin word invidia, which means to look at. So that's a, that's a thought. Envy does begin with people looking at you, wanting your life, wanting what you have, or thinking you shouldn't have it, and this leads to aggression and attack. So from that angle, yeah, that is something that I would feel anxious about and worried about people coming for me. And one of the ways I might deal with that in the ancient world would be to buy for myself or have a friend get for me a Foskinum. And what is more effective than a Foskinum with a Foskinum? Uh, Romans couldn't think of anything either, which is how you end up with critters like this one. So this is a lion shape with several phalluses on it. So it's like a lion phallus with a phallus and a phallus tail and also wings. We're not quite sure what the wings are, but we think the wings are to make it fast so it can like attack and protect. So it's kind of a he protect, he attack, but most of all he, I don't know. I would love to see that meme though. I could use a laugh. Hit me up. Uh, yeah. The bells on it are also meant to draw attention to it, but also to help like scare away the evil eye. So it these we think were worn around the neck. So these are meant to be pendant jewelry things, these um, extra fancy ones. They're often made to look a little bit like goats sometimes too, because goats uh, were animals who were felt to be oversexed and to have very um, aggressive erections. I'm not going to comment on that, but if you know a goat. I'm sure you'll have developed an opinion by now. The wings, though, may also be a reference to a pun that works both in Latin and in English. Um, it's it's a it's a cock with a cock. I'm so sorry. This is a little awkward, but kind of fun. Lest you think we're above this kind of imagery, by the way, you've likely used this kind of apotropaic image without realizing it. I want you to think back to say the last person cut you or, or your rude friend off in traffic. Your friend may have made a ritual gesture, one that I will not repeat here, but we have a ritual gesture in our culture that involves the fingers in a specific configuration that looks very much like a foskinum and is brandished in an aggressive way in order to get somebody to back off. Not that it really works that way all the time. Um, one could argue it's a good way of escalating, but it's better than ramming somebody with your car, I guess. So that's... Uh, not something that we have completely divested from our culture. So you've likely met the Foskinum in an abbreviated form. 
So what if you don't want fertility or you do want fertility? The same amulet can work for both. You've seen these in Ogden. Look at 235 for another example. There are also wearable versions that include a depiction of a uterus, often with a key, which is what this thing is. It, it kind of looks like a weird, cranky, spiky thing, but it's a Roman key. So this this part of the key is the part that you slide into the keyhole, and then you turn the crank around like this in order to open the lock in a Roman lock. And the teeth work just like a modern lock with teeth works in a tumbler lock, it's more or less just like. The uterus may look like a jar, but that was the way ancient people thought uteruses looked. Um, there were some people who thought that the uterus may have two chambers because a lot of mammalian uteruses do, but most people in the ancient world knew that the human uterus was just a single cavity uterus, at least most human uteri. Some are bicornate, but most look like this. So this is from the Welcome Collection. It isn't a wearable. This is a votive offering. This is a terracotta uterus that you would give the healing god if you were praying for uterus issues. So you know, endometriosis, cramps, fertility, baby yes, baby no, anything having to do with your uterus you'd use this for. And I had a student a few years back who in her senior thesis argued that this is an early example of outreach and medical education in order to tell people what their internal reproductive organs look like, which is one of the functions that serves. And for that, this is pretty cool. The key is meant to show the dual nature of this amulet. So depending on how you turned it or what you said over it, it could either lock or unlock um, the mouth of the uterus. We still use this term in medical terminology. The cervical os means the mouth of the neck of the uterus. So we, we still call it the mouth and the neck. Cervix means neck in Latin. Or, you know. This amulet may have been used paired with the kind of rituals that Ogden discusses. It may have also been bound up in a bag, perhaps, with body parts of animals, you know, hyena bits, mule bits. Mules, because they're a hybrid between a horse and a donkey, and the offspring is infertile, that's why mules. So because mules, generally speaking, can't have baby mules. You need a horse and a donkey to get together to make more mules. Using mules as a way of getting yourself less pregnant makes sense. Like that, that logic works. And if you don't know the relationship between things coming in contact with your body and medical effects, this is even a logical part of ancient healthcare practices. Pliny the Elder, you may remember him from his sharp opinions about magi, does think that contraceptive amulets might possibly be legit, but he's a little not sure either. So here are a few more ideas for your amulets. Frequently we find this figure on the outside of the art. So this is an Uroburos. This is a snake that's eating its own tail. So this is a way of closing the beginning. So a snake has a beginning and an end, but if it eats its tail, the snake has no beginning and no end. It's just this continuous circle. It's sealed, but it can't unseal if the snake's mouth opens. So it's a way of binding and capturing what's going on on the inside, protecting it and making it work. So the Uroburos is something that we see in these kinds of inscriptions that are meant to have an effect beyond the literal existence of the jewelry object. Inside, we see spiral writing. So this is writing that's going around more or less like that. So writing in a direction that's not right to left, going back and forth and back and forth, or going around in a spiral is something that you regularly see, especially if you're being protective or trying to like bind things down, keep them in place, then this twisting, like the twisting of a rope, is a good way to do that. 
And then at the center, we have some Egyptian imagery with the scarab. So the sacred scarab was thought to be pushing the sun disk across the sky. So it's a sacred animal that has a protective function, and we're putting it at the center to get some of that Egyptian protectiveness into our amulet. That's not the end of our snake-related things we can put on our jewelry, though. We also have this one. This is the Omphis bina. This is a snake that has no end. It has a head on one end and a head on the other. We think this may have been a misunderstanding of the anatomy of a snake that has like a false head on the one end but it's not two heads. It's just got like a fake head to confuse predators on the back end. But this was thought to be a, a snake that you could actually get a hold of, and then the literal snake could be dried and worn or put into amulets. There was also a sea slug that sometimes they'd dry and use for bracelets too. It was meant to prevent miscarriage. It's an interesting one. This too you also see as part of these kind of luck attracting images because it it doesn't have an end. It just takes things in. So it's all the eating, none of the pooping is the thought here. Okay, so here are a bunch of these things all together in one of many options for your amulet design. On this one, we see a few things that I'm just going to point out here briefly. So there is a mummified body on a boat. So this is an Egyptian reference similar to Egyptian beliefs about the afterlife. There's a crocodile underneath, which is a divine and a, um, Egypt specific reference. Then here we have a rooster with two legs that are kind of grasping a globe, so this might be a reference to a Braxos a little bit. I mean, it's not a whole Abraxas, but it's a Braxos-esque. And then we've got another mummified figure, but instead of being dead on the boat, it's standing up and it's got its hand to its mouth and kind of a high gesture that we see a lot in Persian religion as a way of greeting both the king and a god, as you, you like so. And then here we have a seated figure with a club, which is what Heracles carries with him. And he's also got his hand to his mouth. He's looking away from the dead person and at this moon. We don't know what's going on with that. The moon is opposed to the star. We're also not quite sure what's going on with that. And then, of course, the snake. So we've got chthonic imagery, death imagery, pseudo-Egyptian imagery. The writing on the back side is Greek, though. More about that in a minute. We've got something that looks kind of like a, a Broxos, but not really, also protective rooster. And then the, the way the faces are pointing seems important too. Like the dead person's kind of looking at the rising again person who's maybe looking at this divine figure. If it's Heracles, who was a mortal person who after Danera poisoned him, apotheosized, he became a god. So maybe it's about life after death or immortality or something or other. And then on the probably backside is the inscription, which in Greek says, um, out of respect, I'm not going to pronounce this first name, but this is the personal name of the god of Judaism. So um, that god is the bearer of the secret name, the Lion of Re, secure in his shrine. So Re is an Egyptian god, the god of the sun. Lion is the goddess Sekhmet in Egyptian mythology, but she's associated with Re. She's his protector in some versions. So we've got Egyptian religion, we've got Judaism, we've got a mention of a shrine, we've got this secret name thing, so we have hidden secret knowledge. Um, let me also look at the direction of how this is. Okay, so we've got... Ula freno onoma. Okay, so this is just right to left. So the writing isn't special. Another thing on the front, though, it's hard to see if there's a head or not, but there is this line binding everything here together. So there's at least a symbolic Uruguras on this one. 
So we have syncretism in Ouroboros. No negative. Well, not a lot of negative space, a lot of little figures. The art isn't amazing, but that's not the point. We've got characteres, secret symbols. So there's a lot here that's meant to evoke um, most likely some kind of protection force. So last thought I'll leave you with is an um, isospathia guide in case you're looking for letters to put together into um, secret numbers to have on your items, including a Braxos spelled out so you can see it and put it together. And an image of yet another one of these hematite amulets, this one with its gold housing still on. And it's another one of these god figures on a boat with little symbols all up in the negative space. So this is the idea. So taking all of this, looking through Ogden, I want you to pick uh, a couple of references think through what you think is going on in the ancient examples and either pick an ancient or modern example to analyze like you did the ancient ones or to come up with a modern design that uses ancient logic but like reboots it for your life and circumstances or just make your own original ancient creation for an ancient person to hypothetically use but they're ancient so they can't use it because time travel isn't a thing yet uh and i think that should cover all eventualities there's going to be a little handout guide for you to do with this as well so get yourself some modeling equipment go do some art um if you want you can also sketch out a larger plan for your design so that we can all see it and share and then when you've got it all put together show and tell show me what you've got talk me through what your inspiration from ogden was and what kinds of situations that your item is meant to address in whoever's going to use its life on that thought i'd better get back to making sure mr baby isn't tearing the house. i don't know mr spouse has him he's fine all right later Ciao, guys.